In this episode, I speak with Adam B. Coleman, founder of Wrong Speak Publishing and author of the book, From Black Victim to Black Victor. In this episode, we spoke about what he believes the duties of manhood are, the origins of patriarchy, what the red-pilled community gets right and wrong about these issues, and more. You can follow Adam on Twitter at wrong underscore speak. And as always, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. I hope you enjoy the next episode. Um, it's good to see you. Likewise. I Again. remember, yeah, I remember meeting you and your wife at a dinner that Pamela Perovsky, our dear friend Pamela, uh, uh, adjourned that's not the right word uh cultivated <laughs> curated uh right. at the comedy cellar here in new york city that was really cool um mm. i didn't get to speak to you that intently uh but i'm happy to have the opportunity to do so today on this pod um okay. i've been perusing through some of your Substack pieces really enjoying those and i know that there's a lot of different topics that we can talk about but i really mm -hmm. actually want to focus on a few themes that I've seen come up in your pieces, which really, really um, interest me. And those are the top, the two topics primarily of manhood on the one hand mm -hmm. and loneliness on the other. And perhaps mm -hmm. like how these two things are impacted um, and impact each other. So I guess I'll start with a question. What is your relationship to manhood? How do you view, you know, what a man is, who a man should be? in modern society today? So that's a good question because, uh, so the article you're talking about, I kind of gave like a very uh, brief essential version of like the most important qualities. So uh, the willingness to protect people that they love, um, I think is, is really up there. Um, mm. Belief in self confidence. I think that's extremely important for this uh, success of men. Um, but to, the ultimate answer is I don't fully know. Okay. Um, and and part of the reason is I would say like I'm I'm like eighty percent sure of what manhood is. Um, I know what it isn't more so than I know what it is. Mm. Um, and it's a it's an ever developing question that I ask myself. Um, so people understand, you know, I I grew up without my father. And I didn't really grow up around men in general. I grew up with my mom, my sister. We moved around a lot. So my exposure to men was very um, seldom and sparse. Um, I was in Boy Scouts, but that's something you do like every so often. Um, and not really the same impact mm. that, you know, as having like an uncle that you see all the time or someone who's related to you or, or more importantly, your father. Yeah. So it wasn't a question that I asked myself until I became an adult where I started really asking myself all types of questions. Like, am I really a Christian? Mm. Um, and for a while I was agnostic. Um, you know, and what, what is a man? Uh, how do I raise my son to be a man? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and becoming aware enough to understand that I'm raising my son to become something that I'm not even sure what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just knew not to be my father. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I knew what, what a father wasn't mm -hmm. right. It's not someone who just uh, doesn't care. doesn't come around. Um, you know, this, that's the bare, bare bones of it. But, um, what is a man is a, a very interesting and evolving question. Um, but I, I would put those two things at the very top, the willingness to protect, mm -hmm. um, and the necessity for self-confidence. And I see a lot of men who are unwilling to protect. Mm -hmm. um, and that troubles me. Yeah. And I see a lot of men without confidence mm -hmm. um, who, who doubt themselves and including myself. So everything that I'm, I'm saying here and being critical is actually of myself as well. And I had to overcome these particular things and realize that. So, you know, I, I had, um, depression, anxiety, I had all these things, which are, you have a lot of self-doubt when you're in that mindset. And I don't have those things anymore. I'm pretty sure of what I'm doing. And, it, and I, 
my mindset is if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'll just keep moving. And that mm -hmm. wasn't my mindset years ago. So I've mm -hmm. had to overcome these things. I had to be way more conscious of these things than someone who did grow up with their father, mm -hmm. right? They just are. Yeah. They were around it. They mimic it, you know, unconsciously. And I had to purposely create um, the man I, I am today. Mm -hmm. So I want to first express gratitude to you for being vulnerable about some of the things that you've experienced growing up as a man, becoming a man, the questions that you have around becoming a man. I think that's mm -hmm. really important to model, especially for men. Um, and especially for those men who, you know, we are discussing who may be struggling with that lack of confidence and who may be struggling with feelings of like not being able to express vulnerability because they feel that their manhood will be threatened by it. Right. You know, that's something I really see that's pervasive in our culture today. And I do want to ask you, because I know I've seen some art, well, one article in particular where you speak about how you were quote unquote red pilled um, <laughs> by, by someone in the UK. But I want to, I want to ask you about how that intersects with like concepts of manhood, because I feel like in the self avowed red pilled community, right there, mm -hmm. there is a, there is a kind of a picture of manhood that doesn't sh always show up with this willingness to be vulnerable, with this willingness to admit one's imperfections, et cetera. So how do you like carry both of these identities? So the, the, the red pill in that particular article, what I, what I mean by red pill is not in the sense of the, the men's content red pill, mm -hmm. although I've written articles talking about that, is in the sense of like the matrix, like you take it and you become aware of the mm -hmm. world around you. Um, and that's kind of what I meant uh, okay. in, that sense, in that particular article. But as far as the men's red pill um, or men's content, menosphere, whatever, you know, they have different names for it. Yeah. Um, I actually, it's been pivotal in my life with mm -hmm. that content, but I'm one of those people who I can see that this information is useful and this information isn't. This information mm -hmm. is actually a really good idea, a good concept, and the rest of it is entertainment mm. or it's nonsense or it's junk, mm -hmm. right? So I, myself, along with my wife, we would watch men's content on YouTube, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't going anywhere. So we would watch it constantly and then we would stop and pause and, and have conversations about it. Yeah. So one of the people, like Kevin Samuels, mm. we would watch... And then he would say something, my wife would be like, well, she wasn't my wife at the time, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, we were on, on track for that. And she was like, hold on a second. And then we pause and we would literally talk for an hour and a half to two hours mm -hmm. and just all these different conversations. And, and we'd laugh and we joke and we'd have and have her like really think about stuff and have me think about stuff. So, it, you know, that particular content, I, I think at one point in my life was very useful. Um, at the same time, I'm able to be critical of the bad information because mm -hmm. I think oftentimes what happens is they ignore the inevitable when it comes to men. Mm. They ignore that. Uh, so you have like MGTOW guys, which are men going their own way. They okay. say, uh, do not get married. Mm. Um, and, you know, women are this and women are that. And it's too risky and all that. But the reality is that men want to get married, mm. <laughs> you know, so they're, they're yeah. fighting this uphill battle of the inevitability. Men want to have children. Mm -hmm. Right. So they go over child supports, this and that and family court. But the, it's inevitable that men want to get married and they want to have children, just like mm -hmm. women want to get married, want to have children. So instead of doing something productive by saying, if you want to do it, it is risky, but here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Here are the qualities in a woman that you look for. Here's what you do accept and you don't accept. You don't say the institution is bad. You say, here's how you navigate so you can go through this institution, mm -hmm. which could bite you. And mm -hmm. in many cases, it doesn't bite you. Mm -hmm. um, not every person who goes through a divorce ends up poor and on the streets. Unfortunately, some do. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a gap between uh, teaching men useful information rather than telling them to completely avoid it, run away from it, um, or making everything the woman's fault, mm -hmm. which is funny because the feminism aspect mm -hmm. makes the opposite argument. Right. Um, 
So when the men talk about the divorce rates, well, most women, I'm sorry, uh, most divorces are initiated by women, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a factual statement, but they never ask why. Mm. Or, or how about this? Uh, if you say 80% of divorces are initiated, initiated by women, do you think they just one day woke up and said, I'm going to get a divorce? Right. Or are they more willing to leave a bad relationship more so than the man is? Mm. Did the man have any part in it? I've never met someone who got divorced that didn't, had no part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they were just absolutely perfect. No, like maybe one more than the other, but yeah. we all have some sort of accountability. We never talk about the men who get divorced and you say, bro, there was red flags all over that one. We don't talk about that. We make it, well, she divorced and it's her fault. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a good guy. Yeah. And then repeat the cycle and, and everybody ignores that, that accountability part which is a big part of the menosphere. They claim accountability is really important, but mm -hmm. oftentimes they avoid accountability for men. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of contradictions, but just like many things, there are grains of truth. Mm -hmm. There's some useful information, but then there's also BS and there's entertainment mm -hmm. and you kind of have to pick and choose um, what is what. Mm -hmm. So I, I really have seen this this theme that you just alluded to, which is that the I would call them the pseudo feminists, but the pseudo feminist <laughs> movement and the quite frankly, pseudo, I guess you would call it masculinist movement mm -hmm. um, are in a loop with each other. And so the pseudo feminists blame men for every problem that exists and the pseudo masculinists blame women for every problem that exists when really. I think that we live in a society that perpetuates, I'm going to use a word that often triggers people on the right, um, that, mm -hmm. but that perpetuates oppression against men and women, both alike. Mm -hmm. And it can be very difficult to see it depending upon what position you're standing from, whether it's the position of a woman or the position of a man. But I think that that's what's really uh, happening underneath. And I'll give you, I'll give you a few ideas to sort of wrestle with that have been informing my thinking on this. And I've started to think about this more because some of the men in my life have all of a sudden started being red pilled, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and specifically yeah. as it, as it pertains to the manosphere, as you describe it. And I've, you know, I've heard statistics very much in the abstract sense, you know, perusing Twitter at a glance about some of the struggles that men have been facing. You know, Richard Reeves, for example, has, has talked about this, which I'm sure you're familiar with his work. And you see these statistics about men struggling in terms of like not performing well in school, not having those examples of manhood that they need. So I, I had, I had, um, engage with this content at a glance in a very abstract way. But very recently, about a month ago, I was introduced to this through the new lens, which is the personal lens of experiencing men who are my friends who are experiencing um, acute loneliness, experiencing mm -hmm. this question of, oh, I don't know how to be a man, all of these, all of these topics. So at the time that this was introduced into my life, I was also reading a book called Debt. And this book called Debt, the subtitle is The First 5,000 Years. It was written by a man named David Graeber. And it's a fascinating book. It's really the study of debt as a concept and how it has existed for all of human history, really, and how it's, it's gone mm. through different ebbs and flows. And one of the things he actually studies is patriarchy as, a, as an institution. And I came away reading about patriarchy uh, through his instruction, basically with the conclusion that both the left and the right are wrong about patriarchy. <laughs> so here's what I mean by this. <laughs> According to his scholarship, patriarchy started to become a thing about 5,000 years ago in ancient Sumeria, the first civilization known to man, which is, this was in what is modern day Iraq. This was the first city that was established mm -hmm. in, in civilization. And what happened at that time was there was a debt crisis. So if you can imagine there is a society of, let's say, farmers and peasants and agricultural people that were land-based people. Think of the Bible, right? When you think of like the patriarchs, you think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were like farmers and shepherds, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had that class of people, but then you had the aristocracy, 
which lived in the cities. And there was a debt crisis that resulted in profound inequality, wealth inequality between these two classes, such that the men in the farming and shepherding and peasant classes were having to sell themselves into essentially like debt slavery to the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And in a way where they couldn't, they could never pay them back. And not only did they have to sell themselves into slavery, it began to be that they had to sell their wives and their daughters into slavery as well, which of course led to all kinds of things like sex slavery and prostitution and what we sort of have come to know today. So patriarchy was actually a reaction to an acute sense of powerlessness among men that were a part of a specific economic class, you may say, you Mm -hmm. could say. And so this desire to protect your daughters and your wives from oppression came out of this ecosystem. And that really struck me as profoundly um, tragic, but also fascinating because Mm -hmm. it called into question on the one hand, this sort of in the men's group sort of red pilled idea that like patriarchy as a thing has always existed since the dawn of time. It called into question that on the one hand, but it also called into question the left's sort of like reflexive disgust and contempt towards patriarchy. Right. And I'm just, and I'm wondering, I know, I know that I'm throwing a lot at you right now, but like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm wondering like how that sits with you to like hear that and, and wrestle with that. I mean, it doesn't shock me that, both sides are wrong. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It happens often. Um, No, I think that's, I think that's very interesting that, that there's a class and there's a um, economic factor Mm -hmm. to all of this. Um, Actually, the thought just crossed my mind. Something that a lot of the, the menosphere guys talk about and I, and I understand it, the concept of, of, Women, um, finding a woman who is traditional enough where they have children with and the men work and raise their, you know, work to take care of their home um, while the wife is able to stay home and raise their children because they Mm -hmm. see that as a very uh, important aspect to raising a family and how it's incredibly difficult to do that now. Mm -hmm. And basically the only people who are able to do that are generally economically sound right super wealthy Um, super wealthy and that that concept is something that i don't think they ever make that connection between like you said wealth inequality um the the shrinking of of the gap between the two classes or between the various classes i should say Mm -hmm. and how that affects relationships Mm-hmm. And so when they, let's say we'll, we'll take their position that uh, there are too many women who are money hungry, who mm-hmm. are just chasing the bag and all this other stuff. Well, I mean, in some respects, you kind of have to, yeah. right? If you see that there's an economic advantage to telling this guy whatever he wants to hear and he buys you all this stuff and he pays for your bills. I mean, that's kind of what you have to do because maybe the lifestyle that you really want to live is not even achievable Mm-hmm. In without, that, in it. The, in the, without it yeah um you know so i think there there's definitely a lot of economics that come to it one of the messages that you see a lot of ministry guys talk about is get your money up yeah um they say if you want to have more successful women you have to be economically sound you can't i mean granted that you can't be the guy who lives in your parents basement sure uh you know working at mcdonald's you have to build your skill set, level yourself up. I think that's generally a positive thing that you tell uh, to tell anybody, but you know, especially tell men, because it is very important when it comes to providing first for yourself and then for others. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't. I think it's just semi-ironic that I don't think they make that connection. Mm. You know that yes, get your money up, um, but they make it from a connection of women are attracted to money. As right. well, right? You know, but they—that's what I'm saying. A lot of people, whether it's politics or culture, they make the superficial arguments, but they don't look like just like one layer deeper than that. It's like, mm-hmm. well, ask yourself why. Why is that the case? Mm-hmm. I have heard. I will say this: I've heard very few, but I've heard people talk about how um, 
women entering the workforce possibly has altered um, work pay and things of that nature that that could possibly contribute. So now you have an entire, if conceptually, you have an entirely new workforce that's available for you mm-hmm. competing against the men who were the single providers. And so that dilutes how much you pay people because there's more options, mm-hmm. there's more skill sets. Um, and so you can't pay, maybe, maybe as inflation rises prior to that, I have no idea. I'm not an economist, but yeah. maybe as inflation was rising, you could pay the guys more because the workforce was a certain size. But when that increases, let's say 25%, yeah. then, you know, you have more competition for the same job. Um, theoretically, I don't know, yeah. but at the same time, I'm not even sure how true that is. I mm-hmm. think. I think what actually happened is our economy changed. Mm -hmm. So whereas, you know, the 1950s, the baby boomers, or actually probably was that the greatest generation, those Mm -hmm. adults, um, they had more factory jobs. We have more Mm -hmm. manufacturing jobs. Um, Maybe there were more, some clerical jobs that few women who were working could work, but we switched to a service economy Mm -hmm. and away from manufacturing. And those manufacturing jobs have gone elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think many of those men who feel lost, who um, are struggling economically, probably live in some sort of area where jobs are sparse. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas decades ago, there would have been some factory that that the entire town would have just gone and worked at Mm -hmm. is gone. Um, And it's I don't think a lot of people realize that there are there are still towns today that are like that where a huge population of people within these surrounding areas, they all work at that same factory. Mm-hmm. And if that factory goes away, that it w- wipes out everything, the restaurants, yeah. all the services around it, it disappears. So I'm kind of ranting, but yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's a really good and important thing to point out. I mean, that creates a lot of societal dislocation and, mm-hmm. and the feeling of alienation being uprooted from your community it has a quantum effect, like you said, on the restaurants, on the way the society or the town runs. Can you talk a little bit about the paradox? At least I think it's a paradox that it, it almost seems it, this, this, the way this works is so elegant, it's almost impossible to escape. And what I mean by that is if you live in a society that where you have to get your bread up, you know, as as is said mm-hmm. in the in that <laughs> space, um, you can fall into the trap of like your sense of self-worth being defined by how much things you have. I've seen this in sort of like the, I'm going to call it the land of Andrew Tate to, (laughs) to give a, you know, I've seen this, this very dehumanizing thing, which yes, in his rhetoric, he dehumanizes women, but he also dehumanizes men in the same that, in the sense that he, you know, these two things depend upon each other, right? He objectifies men. He turns men into objects fulfilling a function whereby their sense of self-worth depends upon how many objects they have, whether the object is money, power, wealth, cars, women, which they are seeing as objects to exploit resources from and so the system this is why i think that the the term red pill is such a ironic and um insufficient term because you know in the mm-hmm. matrix neo disrupts the system and and <laughs> trend, and and changes the system but in a way a lot of what i see in terms of the rhetoric that's being spread is perpetuating the system and so can you right. talk about how have you seen this at all where where men men's sense of self-worth is actually becomes dependent upon how much they can have, which actually reinforces some of the dehumanization of men that I'm seeing. Yes. So the, the Andrew Tate's of the world makes the world superficial. Mm. Um, and first of all, Andrew Tate contradicts himself all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, he'll, he'll talk about women committing haram. Meanwhile, how did he make his money again? Mm. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just That's it's right. stuff like that. Um, Mm-hmm. So, but I think that when it comes Wait, to... Wait, but for those who don't know, actually, can you oh, say yeah. how he made his <laughs> money? Because I know, but I don't know if the audience knows, yeah. right? So basically, most of his money, uh, where he became wealthy, he started running campsites. Um, and he was getting mostly girls from, or mostly women from uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and so the stuff that put him in jail what has a lot to do with his business and how he 
supposedly treated women. Some of it may be true. Some of it may not be. Ultimately, when you get in that type of world, you you the, the outcome you get <laughs> looks much like what he's going through right now. So, um, you know, you you play with snakes, you might get bit. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but to to go back to what I was saying, yes, uh, it's very superficial. I think the way to actually explain it is that men are doers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to feel like we're fulfilling some sort of purpose. Mm-hmm. The problem isn't I don't make enough money. The problem is what what purpose do I have? Mm-hmm. If the guy could be, as long as you're making enough money where you can take care of yourself, I think that is a strong bare minimum. And I think that is an achievable goal for most men. Okay. Right. But do you feel a sense of purpose? Mm. Right. And if everything relies off of that particular job as fulfilling your, your purpose, then maybe that is a problem. Maybe it isn't. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But I think it's the the concept of purpose for men. That's what's important. Mm. The uh, which car do I have? Uh, how big am I? Is my house? Those are all like superficial stuff that ultimately won't make you happy. And this was another thing that I had to overcome for myself. I was really into cars at one point. I was going through cars. I was modifying I was so much money. So I was like, "What happened to all that money?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah and it's just money flushed down the toilet but i had to look at like why was i doing that oh because i was unhappy mm-hmm. right so just like if you know stereotypically like if a woman becomes a shopaholic mm-hmm. well why is she a shopaholic right well, because it's an endorphin hit every time she gets something new well it's right. the same thing with me when every time i buy a new car part i feel it for a few days and i drive around with it and guess what it goes back down and uh mm-hmm. and i'm like well when's the next time i get paid yeah, it, it's the same type of thing. And I think we're in cold, uh, people like Andrew Tate and others are encouraging this type of mentality of superficialness of objects will make you happy. Mm-hmm. And when I got out of that mindset and actually started focusing on myself and what actually makes me happy, what do I like doing? That's when I started becoming happy. Mm-hmm. What, what service do I provide? Becoming a better father, uh, eventually getting married. Um, how can I help more people? Like one of the things I realized just for me personally is I like to help people. Mm-hmm. And no matter what I'm doing, you know, most of my jobs have been customer service related. So I, I enjoy helping people. And that's what my purpose is. My mm-hmm. purpose is to help other people as much as I can to uplift other people. And that's what I'm even doing as a writer. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, it just drops off. That's um, okay. That's why I, I try to do as a writer. I try to help uplift other writers. Mm-hmm. Um, I try to connect people with editors. I try to uh, use wrong speak as a platform for people who who want an avenue f- to speak. Mm-hmm. This is my purpose: is to is to help people along the way and leave a positive Im- impact on society. And I think young men, especially, are being robbed by this mm-hmm. by people like Andrew Tate who just says, I got a Bugatti Mm -hmm. and I got a Maserati and I got this, (laughs) I've reached success. And then they sell them on, well, you can be like me too. It's like, no, Mm -hmm. they can't. And I wouldn't (laughs) advocate that they go the route that you did to get to that either. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I am struck by how the metaphor of, you know, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, who says to him, you know, Worth, I will give you all the riches of the world if only you bow down to me, right? And 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 tell me that 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 or show me, you know, deference. It seems to me that that's really what's happening with a lot of the Andrew Tates of the world. You know, he's saying mm-hmm. that if you if you live your life according to the ethos that I have embodied, then you'll be able to have the whole world. But of course, you may lose your soul in the process. I'm curious as to what advice you would give to young men who are feeling disaffected, vulnerable, um, lost, really, and tempted by the shiny object, (laughs) you know, (laughs) on YouTube. Like, what advice, what, what advice would you give them? Like, how would you, how would you steer them or try to steward them on the right path? Well, for one, my advice usually starts with the mentality. You have to be optimistic. Mm. Um, and 
I think there is too much negativity that exists um, within the manosphere or just in general. Mm -hmm. When everybody feeds you that uh, you can't get a woman unless you do this, you can't do this, you can't do that, then at some point you're going to start to believe it. Mm. And I would say optimism has to be something that you you have to keep reinforcing within yourself. Uh, I don't know successful people who are negative. Mm. Like, I, don't, I don't know how you become a multimillionaire with a negative mentality. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like something that's extremely difficult to do. You have to believe in yourself. And I, and I think all those things, if you remain optimistic, you believe in yourself, um, which is a difficult thing to do, mm -hmm. to actually believe in yourself. And I think some of that comes with small bits of success. Um, mm. You know, I was talking to a man who was going through chronic depression mm -hmm. and I was telling him, all right, are you getting out of bed every day? Yes. Are you taking a shower? Yes. Okay. Um, are you making your food? No, I'm not doing that every day, but do you think you can? Yes. All right. Mm. Do that. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just small steps until you get towards success. Now he's, he was far behind where most, I would say most men are. He was in a really bad position, but he can't, he can't leap to mm -hmm. reach that goal. He has to take small steps to reach that goal. And I would say that's what most people have to do. They mm -hmm. have to, they have to have small achievable goals. And once they achieve it, then they start to believe that they can continue to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's how you kind of slowly build up your confidence. That's what happened for me when I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to go for this job. And I was able to get the job. And it's like, maybe I, maybe I am capable of doing these things. And I, mm -hmm. as, and I couldn't do what I'm doing today if I didn't actually believe in myself. But um, I would say believe in yourself, remain optimistic, have incremental increases and develop a skill. If you mm -hmm. already have a skill, get better at it. Mm -hmm. um, that is how you market yourself. That is how you become useful in society. People pay you according to your value mm -hmm. as far as what you provide to mm -hmm. the society. Um, and if you have a skill set, if you have a skill, then people will pay you according to it. Mm -hmm. If you can get even better at it, they will pay you even more, right? And that skill could be something extremely useful. Right. Even if it's entertainment, entertainment's mm -hmm. a useful thing for a lot of people. It takes mm -hmm. their mind off of the crap that they might have to go through. Mm -hmm. But it's a skill set. Um, so always work on yourself and build yourself up. Um, and last thing I will say is for young men, and I tell my son this, do not chase women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and that was one thing I had to learn for myself as well. I was so much uh, I had so much invested in what women thought of me. Mm -hmm. that I didn't think of myself mm -hmm. in a high, high regard. Mm -hmm. When the reality is, I believe personally that women are attracted to men who are just, uh, I don't want to say more successful, but they're just attracted naturally to positive attributes. Mm -hmm. And if you build those things, you don't have to chase women. You don't have to convince them. You don't have to talk them into stuff. It will just happen. Mm -hmm. And that, that's literally what happened with my wife. I wasn't even trying to pick her up, just having conversation. And it just led into that. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of guys who are trying to figure out like uh, how to pick up women, how to trick them into this, mm -hmm. how to, <laughs> yeah. you know, how to do all these manipulative things. And you don't need to do that. And even if it worked, it won't last. Right. Um, you want to do something that is ultimately positive especially if you're talking about having a life partner, which yeah. most men want to have some sort of life partner. So you, if you focus on yourself, the woman will come. Mm -hmm. And I, I told, I tell my son that, and he's uh, 17, you'll be 18 soon. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, keep, keep working on yourself. Keep working, keep doing your thing. Lead. Women mm -hmm. want a guy who leads, lead, build yourself up, become a leader, right? Be, become someone who's respectful. Uh, because you can't have a successful relationship if the woman doesn't respect you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, I, I hope that all the men watching, all the young men watching <laughs> this can hear you on that. Um, can you say anything, and I know you can because of your experience, but I would love to hear it in your own words. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've read different articles about your experience with poverty and loneliness and and the feeling of depression as well. Can you give any advice, and this is advice of an emotional nature, right? Can you give any advice to the young men 
who may be watching this, who are experiencing that on that that very deep and and dark feeling of loneliness and sadness and because I feel like there's the doing aspect, right? But there's also mm -hmm. the allowing yourself to feel the feelings and move through the feelings without suppressing them that doesn't necessarily get uh, transmitted as instruction to men. Um, yeah. So yeah, can you say a little bit about that and, and talk a little bit also about your experience with that? Yeah, um, I've had multiple bouts of depression or loneliness as well. Um, the one article I wrote about was when I, I moved out to Tennessee. Um, I thought I was going to be staying with a friend. Turns out that friend then lied to me about much of his own life. Mm. Um, so in some ways I was kind of catfished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't a good situation. I had packed up everything from New Jersey, moved out to Tennessee. Um, I did have a job. Uh, thankfully I was, I got hired before I moved out there. So I knew that I was going to be working the following week. Um, so I had an opportunity to make money, but I just didn't have a place to stay. And, um, thankfully the, the people who worked on my job actually put together money. So I stayed in a hotel until I, mm. I had enough to get a, an apartment. Um, I never asked for any money back. You know, they just wanted to make sure I was safe. Uh, Cause I was going to sleep in my car and just kind of deal mm. with it. Um, but even with getting in, when I was finally able to get into my own apartment, I didn't really have that much money and I'm starting from scratch. So like the feeling was like every day I would empty, enter this empty apartment. I had no furniture. Uh, I had an air mattress, mm. <laughs> you know, that would constantly get deflated. Mm. Uh, I went through multiple air mattress. It's not a reliable thing to sleep on. I was just, kind of, it was a miserable environment to kind of be in because I was so alone. Um, you know, I went out there because I thought I could learn a skill set that I thought would make me um, more prepared for the world economically. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it, even though I was being away from my son, I was doing it so I could provide for my son. Mm -hmm. um, I never really, I never wanted to be away from my son. I, I just spent basically nine, 10 months raising my son, mm -hmm. um, every day. And so all of a sudden being away from him, being completely alone, like I missed my son mm -hmm. very much. So, um, ultimately I was only there for about a year, about 11 months to be exact. And then I came back home and I've been with my son ever since, but it was, it was being in that environment where you don't know anybody. You're, I was truly alone. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, needing to talk to people on the phone who back from back home, like that was my only sense of connection with people mm -hmm. for the most part until I would go to work. Um, I would work overtime, not necessarily because I needed the money. I mean, the extra money was helpful, but because I didn't want to go home, like I had nothing waiting for me at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would get four days off at times. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of time to do nothing and be alone. Um, you know, I, during that period, I did have thoughts of suicide um, because that loneliness really eats at you. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what ultimately got me out of it was for one leaving in the end and going back home. Um, but just kind of realizing like, this is temporary. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, so the advice I would tell someone who is lonely is understand that it may be temporary, depending on the circumstance. Um, if it is, if it is eating at you that much, go see help. Mm. Go see a therapist. I've seen therapists uh, a couple of times in my life. Um, actually, probably more than a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, but therapy is, is extremely beneficial. Uh, for one, you get to talk to somebody because if you're in that mind mindset, you should talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to figure out strategies on what to do mentally, uh, what you can actually do to be around other people. Because I think with loneliness, it's like it's like a um, it's like quicksand, mm. right? If you believe quicksand is real, then you're going to sink into it. But 
And Mm so it just keeps dragging you down. And so you believe that loneliness is what you're supposed to be in. Like you're so doubtful. You're so nihilistic. Mm -hmm. You don't think that you can do anything about it. Um, No one wants to be around me. Like you're Mm -hmm. just in a constantly negative space. Um, And then what's funny is that you reinforce it. So when you do go around other people and you do try and it doesn't work, see, I knew this wasn't mm-hmm. going to work. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's stuff like that. Um, so you have to, you have to break the cycle. If it means going to see a therapist, go see a therapist. If it means changing your environment, mm-hmm. change your environment. Um, but, you know, the loneliness part, it's just something that I've noticed about the younger generation mm-hmm. where, Even for me back then, um, you know, we had the internet, but it wasn't, it wasn't like how it is today. Yeah. Um, And I feel like, like I use, I use the example of when we were kids, most of the pictures we would take would be with family members and friends Mm -hmm. at events. Mm -hmm. And most of the pictures you see today, they're by themselves in Mm -hmm. their room, (laughs) you know, so they're disconnected physically from people. And I think a lot of people put on a face, put on mm. a smile, um, but it's, there's almost like a one for one correlation when it comes to people who take the most pictures, mm. I feel like are the loneliest people mm. because they're needing that adulation. They need people to notice that they're there. Uh, but some mm. of them are amongst the most miserable people because you don't need to take pictures of yourself every day. Why right. would you do that? Right. Um, so I, I just think that there's kind of like this silent crisis of lonely people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the pandemic had made it worse. Mm-hmm. Um, isolating people, telling them to stay home, placing fear around it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're definitely not leaving their home. So I, I think there's a lot of that that's going on today and not enough people talk about it. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine that the constant take taking of pictures of oneself is a way to like reaffirm to yourself that you are here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, which you might not have if you're not engaging. Or you might not have as much if you're like in community with others. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's really profound. I I wonder what I mean, maybe this is sort of like a too large a scale of a question, but is there any advice that you would or any questions that you would ask policymakers <laughs> to think about? <laughs> um when thinking about some of the some of the topics that we've wrestled with, I mean, these are deep and profound topics. What does it mean to be a man? What what does one do with loneliness? How does one ensure that their sense of self is not dependent upon the accumulation of things? Like when you're shaping public policy, like what questions might be useful for a policymaker to ask themselves so that they don't mistakenly because i think that most people have good intentions so they so that they don't mistakenly create a society that reinforces some of the value systems that are actually superficial right that we're that we're having yeah. to be locked into as citizens of this nation so i think um studies can be helpful to kind of understand the impact of what's going on in the country mm-hmm. um so that but granted, that wouldn't necessarily come from lawmakers, but I think that's stuff that uh, there are certain agencies that could do these particular studies. Like CDC has done, mm. you know, some studies similar to this. Um, that kind of thing could happen. There could be, um, I actually know someone in the state of Washington who is going to lawmakers to have some sort of, I'm trying to think of the best way of putting it, but kind of like a um, an apparatus that would look after boys Mm. so how the the government might say here's the 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 state of girls in america or the state of girls in in washington state they want something similar for the boys because they feel that the boys are being overlooked Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. they grow up to become the people that we criticize and Mm -hmm. committing crimes but they needed help a long time ago Mm -hmm. um so i think there are those aspects but I, I'm one of those people who tries not to say that the government needs to fix many of the, the issues that we're experiencing. Mm-hmm. Um, our relationship problems are cultural. Mm. Um, m- many of the things that we talk about are actually cultural issues, even kind of crime. Crime is, mm. I would say, is much more of a cultural issue. Um, now, uh, 
criminal justice, yeah, that's a policy thing. How do mm-hmm. you how do you deal with different crime in different areas? But the the root of it is well, are people born criminals? Mm-hmm. Well, how how do they become criminals? Are they developed this way because of the circumstances they grew up in? Um, and oftentimes, and I've I've joked before because I say I feel like Ibram X Kendi, but mm-hmm. with with talking about single parent homes and in <laughs> childhood trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a matter of where the childhood trauma happen mm-hmm. that leads for them to become the people that, that they ultimately become. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I just don't know happy, healthy, purposeful people that rob and kill people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like right. they just, they just don't do that. Right. And so how can we have a society of more happy and um, healthy children and oftentimes it has to do with protecting them from childhood trauma, protecting mm-hmm. them from certain situations. So like one of the arguments that I make all the time is, you know, when we talk about single parent homes, it's beyond the, you know, patriarchy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's about understanding that there are important things that children learn from the mothers and the fathers. Uh, the most important parent is the same sex parent to a child. Mm. but there are things that little girls learn from their fathers. Mm. The father mimics the first important man Mm -hmm. and, and how he treats his mother Mm -hmm. plays a profound role in how she sees men and what she expects for herself. Mm -hmm. And when that man is missing, well then how does she know how to pick men? Mm -hmm. And just anecdotally, I know women who grew up without their father and they are lost when it comes to getting away from terrible men Mm -hmm. And they just go towards the shiny object Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, and then it leads towards trouble. And then we just continue the cycle. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some sort of um, cultural change to understand that how we family plan is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And um, one other thing I would say is um, I've written a couple of articles talking about how single parent homes are not just about keeping the man in the house, but also a line of protection Mm. uh, for children. It's, it's gone once the father is gone. Mm. And when the boyfriend comes in, when the stepfather comes in, that is a huge increase in likeliness of children being molested, Mm. um, physically abused, uh, malnourished, you name it. Mm -hmm. Um, That, The nuclear family, especially in a a married sense, Mm -hmm. is the safest environment for children. Mm -hmm. And I think if we were to actually tell people that, that makes them kind of think Mm -hmm. rather than it being like, well, they should have their parents. And I think there's a lot of we tell people what should happen. We don't say why. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I was I was talking about this concept as far as it's the safest environment environment for children. I talked about stepfathers and, mm-hmm. and the abuse that happens. And I, I was talking on a podcast about this. And when I was finished, one of the guys said, you know, the exact scenario you just said was my childhood. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, no one's talking about this. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there is far too much selfishness as far as what the parents want, how I feel. Mm. I don't feel wanted anymore. You know what? I'm done with this. Mm. And hopefully the kids are fine. Right. And, and it's just whatever the parents want, whatever the parents want. And there's just not enough thought about the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I knew a family growing up. They stayed together until the kids left house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then mm-hmm. they got a divorce. Mm-hmm. But at least they had that in, in mind. Maybe they couldn't stand each other for the last four years. Yeah. But they said, our our kids are more important and we need to stay here together mm. and, and be impactful in their life and keep the peace. Mm-hmm. And then they split up. Mm-hmm. If that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. But I just don't think we think about the kids as much as we, we should. Mm. Yeah, that's... It's so interesting. My parents have been married for, I think, like 35 years now. Mm. Sorry, mom and dad, if I got that wrong. But I know that <laughs> my my like my father told me stories of like how he experienced the impact of his parents being divorced and sort of being caretaken by different uh, people in his family, matriarchs, patriarchs alike. But that that gave him a sense of like insecurity 
not just mm-hmm. like existential emotional security, but just like practically insecurity, right? And he and his brothers actually um, made a commitment to be married as a result of that experience. And, to, and so, you know, he and his brothers are all married. Um, yeah. And of course that has impacted me, like, you, like you're describing exactly to a T, like seeing and having a father in my life has impacted how I look at men and, and how I perceive what a man is and what a man should be versus what a man should not be or should not show up as. Um, and that a hundred percent has impact on like the relationships that we, that we create in adulthood. But of course it's a, it's a real tragedy because what's often happening is like the, the parent, let's say the father. And I've mm-hmm. seen this actually, I've, I've seen this dynamic in Andrew Tate's life specifically. Um, cause I'm reading a book about his father right now. Um, who was this chess master and who was like a brilliant, you know, person in the army or in armed services, but like was in a large extent or to a large extent absent from his son's life. Um, mm-hmm. and, and he also had his own rocky relationship with his own father, who was in many ways brutal and gave him a brutal reality of, um, of what it meant to be a man, right? As he perceived mm-hmm. it. And so you have this situation where like, yes, parents who, who are oftentimes absent or disappear from their, from their children's life are themselves, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way at all, but are themselves children who are still suffering from the wounds that they were not able to heal, that their parents passed down to them, which their parents passed down to them, which their parents passed down to them. And in some cases, you know, Parent, the parent that passed it down to them, let's be real, going all the way back, like were in those two parent family homes, right? And still mm-hmm. the, the the way that they parented was so brutal that it it caused, you know, this internal fractioning and dislocation. So it's very tricky. Um, and I just wanted to say that because I think it's important that we we hold the critique for folks you know, like the Andrew Tates of the world while also doing so with grace and with a, a real awareness of like the dynamic that that is within them, that is alive within them today. You know, um, it's funny because you this is the first time you talked about your parents being married and you grew up with both your parents. If I was to guess, I would have guessed that. <laughs> and, and the reason I would have guessed that is because you're a generally happy, positive person, your demeanor, mm. the vibe that you put off. And I think there are a lot of people who, especially, I would say, especially young women that mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm very noticing of this, their reaction to things, how they carry themselves, um, their jadedness. Mm. Um, you know, I've said this, my, my viewpoint on, I would say like the fourth wave uh, I don't even know what wave, but feminists, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, the more, more misandrous kind of feminists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But when you listen to them, oftentimes they are survivors of trauma mm-hmm. and, and many times survivors of childhood trauma, whether it be uh, neglect, sexual abuse, physical mm-hmm. abuse. Um, but it's primarily from a male figure mm-hmm. that this happened with. And so you have an ideology that reinforces their, their animosity Or actually it reinforces like, hey, that abuse that you went through with a man, guess what? That's what they all do Mm -hmm. or that's what they're all prone to do. And Mm -hmm. you should be fearful of them. You should hate them. And that's why I see like there's so many things that we talk about like, oh, you know, look at the woke and look at this, look at these people. But then like when you look at a deeper level, you're like, yeah, these these are people who are suffering. Yeah. Actually. Um, And they've been suffering for a long time. And then here come the malevolent figures who give them an ideology, Mm. um, you know, who give them, uh, Mm. you know, they say that their confusion, that their frustration is valid. It's okay to feel this way. Um, You know, the fat acceptance movement, don't lose Mm -hmm. weight. You Mm -hmm. know, this is who you're supposed to be. Like, it's just people who are constantly reinforcing their negative life circumstance, even the incels, Mm -hmm. same thing. Um, Hey, maybe I should become better and I should lose. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Stay miserable with us. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a lot of that, but there's a lot of childhood trauma. Yeah. Um, and when I talk about it, I get DMS from people, I get emails from people. 
Um, and, and there's a lot of people who are hurting because of it. Mm-hmm. And we just don't talk about them. We just, we see the superficial, we see the, the top layer, yeah. crime, poverty, uh, you know, the woke. We just look at yeah. it at a very superficial level, but too many times it, it, it's way deeper than that. And do you think there's something about the platforms that we engage in, whether it's, well, especially Twitter, that like mm-hmm. keep us at that superficial level? Like how might we... You think it's possible to use these platforms to get us to engage on a deeper level? Because I worry about that sometimes. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be okay. honest with you, no. Um, okay. The way I see social media, and, and granted, I'm coming from like the, I don't know what other way to put it, but like the influencer level. Mm-hmm. The way I see social media is not to necessarily have deep conversations. I think it's nonsense. Twitter spaces, for the most part. I think it could have been that, but it's more so for clout and show and all this other stuff. I, I don't think that social media is an avenue actually for that. Okay. Um, I think social media is an avenue for expressing yourself and keeping it moving. Okay. Or if you're one of those people who just wants to get followers, then you can cause conflict and do all that stuff. I don't engage in that. Mm -hmm. And I do that very purposefully. I don't engage in what I call like psyop stuff where we talk about trans all day and, mm. and, <laughs> and talk about the woke all day. No, I want to talk about stuff that actually matters. The, the deeper conversation stuff I think is good for stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Or how about people go outside? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think people need to seriously go outside. Um, and I've said that before. The, the stuff that I sometimes read on Twitter, I'm like, what, what society do you live in? Because... <laughs> you, you, it's, it's very warped. Mm. It's very nihilistic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I actually want less conversations online. I want more conversations in person mm-hmm. um, and actually go out and talk to people and meet people. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, I don't think social media is that place. And on top of that, like most people are terrible at communicating mm. and they're even worse at communicating via text. Yeah. So your best bet is to talk to them on the phone, in person. Don't do the text because you can interpret it and read it whichever which way, and it, it doesn't work out. Hmm. Well, I hear you. I do have hold out. <laughs> I do hold out hope for, perhaps naively, uh, for platforms like like Twitter. But you know, we shall we shall see what happens. We are um, nearing the end of our time together. And so I want to mm-hmm. thank you for coming on the pod, The Heart Speaks, and you know, sharing with us some of your life experiences as well as some of the wisdom and advice you can uh, give to young people. I, I really hope a lot of young people and people in general who may be struggling, because you know, people of all ages you know, can be struggling in our modern yeah. society. I hope they take a lot from what you said and really think deeply about it and internalize it and apply it to their lives. Um, is there any last thing that you want to pr- promote or, um, yeah, promote so that we can tell people where to follow you, where they can check out your stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm the most active on Twitter. Um, so they can follow me at wrong underscore speak. Um, but like you, you mentioned, my Substack, uh, mm-hmm. adambcoleman.substack.com. Um, and they can also check out my book, Black Victims of Black Victor. Um, best places on Amazon. Mm-hmm. You can get it from there. Um, but my, I'll just say this. My ultimate objective is to leave a positive light mm. on the world um, and, and to help as many people as I can and to challenge power. Uh, mm. I don't think that we do that enough. I think we challenge dumb stuff, <laughs> but we don't challenge the things that actually matter. And I think we're being trained not to challenge those things too. So um, that's what I try to do every Mm. day. Adam B. Coleman, thank you for joining me today. Uh, My producers will definitely let you know when this episode is out so you can promote it on all your channels. And um, be well, take care. And I hope to see you soon at another one of uh, Pamela's dinners. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the problem is I'm in New Jersey. And she, uh, she does it like 6 p.m. on a Tuesday. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I, yeah, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. so that's why I haven't, I haven't been able to go. But if she was to do it like on a Saturday, I'm yeah. like, I'm, I, can, I can definitely do it. But yeah. Okay, Pamela, I hope you're watching this, this pod. <laughs> you, get, you, get, uh, you get that advice. All right. Well, sounds yeah. good. Um, and uh, I, well, I hope to see you soon nonetheless. And, and please give my best to your wife and your son as well. 
Thank you. Take care. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Peace.